Hello, welcome to Miniature Realms. My name's Stuart, and if you're an old dwarf fan like myself, it's an incredibly exciting time to be in the hobby. With the Dwarf and Mountain Holds about to release for Warhammer the Old World, I thought it was the perfect opportunity to chat to a famous dwarf fan, none other than Gav Thorpe, writer of the 6th edition army book and manager of the Warhammer side of the business during 6th edition, then to go on and write a number of dwarf novels for Black Library. Miniature Realms is proudly sponsored by Baron of Dice, premium wargaming dice. Over 500 styles, over 4,000 customer reviews, welcome to the best dice on the planet. Gav, thank you very much for taking the time to come and talk to me about dwarves. It's uh, an exciting time for dwarf players with new stuff for the old world. I know you're not involved in that, but um, I'm being really reignited my my passion for dwarves with, with all the painting and stuff I've been doing towards that. I know a lot of the viewers on the channel will be really interested to, to, to hear your sort of points of view and your time working on dwarves. But before we do that, you can just give a bit of an introduction about yourself, who you are, your, your work in the industry. Yes, so... Um... I uh, I was a, a games developer and various other positions for Games Workshop for 14 years. I joined in 1993 um, as an assistant games developer. Uh, when the company was expanding, um, I then spent uh, about a year and a half in, as an assistant games developer, then moved to White Dwarf magazine, where I was doing all kinds of stuff, um, Dog's body, basically, but also staff writer, photography, layout, all kinds of like across the spectrum kind of production and things like that. Uh, then I moved back to games development as games developer and worked on various things. The tail end of um, second edition 40k, so I wrote the first Sisters Battle Codex. I was involved with Gork and Morker and Digginob, things like that. Um, and then third edition 40k was a big one uh, in. Uh, and, and spent most of my time up until 2000 working on 40k and then in 2000 when 6th edition Warhammer was launched uh, by uh, Thomas Pyrrhonen, Rick Priestley, a few others, um, I took over from Thomas in taking over basically in charge of the games development for Warhammer, which was uh, an exciting time to do that. It was good fun um, and we did lots of stuff for um, through, through 6th and 7th edition Warhammer uh, and I left just sort of just before work was beginning on 8th edition in, so say 2007, 2008-ish. Um, I think 2008 is when I left. Um, but also, obviously, I also write for Black Library and other people, um, and in my time there, I've been writing a couple of dwarf novels when I can. Not as many as I'd like, but we can get into that later. Mm. Um, it's always one of those I'd like to go back and do more, but now there's an opportunity potentially. Um, we'll see. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of... That's me. I've been a freelance writer, game designer, and various other things um, since leaving um, 16 years ago. But I've always been a fan of dwarfs, as it were, in, in Warhammer. Um, um, so I thought, you know, they were they were my chosen army. I've held off for 40k and dwarfs for Warhammer, which is an interesting combo. <laughs> um, so sort of like space elves and dwarfs. But, and funnily enough, in Epic, because Epic was the main game I played Epic, you know, sort of Space Marine and Titan Legions. I actually had an orc army. I really liked having a big orc war because I think I liked armies that really encapsulate different things for a game system or a universe. And so for me, like Epic was about a huge horde of orcs and this massive cult speed. And the gargants were really fun because they moved like um, battleships, you know, the orders you gave them and things. And then in, in 40K, it was about cool exotic war gear and, and like the synergies of, um, and, and basically Jess Goodwin and White Dwarf 127 and the, the really ones to the aspect where I was the Eldar and stuff like that just hooked me basically. But for dwarves, it's always been that, conf that, that, um, combination of like good sturdy blocks of infantry and war engines you know for me that's a, a warhammer army i'm not so fussed about like knights and, and chariots and that they can be kind of cool but actually a raid on the battlefield a dwarf army just looks cool and has the elements i, I associate with playing warhammer the most um but i came to it from actually via an empire army so just so sort of like so i joined so i joined just after the launch of second edition 40k so fourth edition warhammer had been out for about a year but not long before Fourth Edition Warhammer came out, there was a huge relaunch of the Empire, and lots of new models by the Perry Twins and things like that, and War Wagon and all kind of, and lots of 
Um, it, it, was, it was really sort of like a step towards making the, the modern Warhammer and taking it out of one fancy roleplay background into the Warhammer battle background. Um, and lots of cool, so loads of people were into Empire and there's loads of cool things, but you can still have Imperial Dwarfs. And so I was, so like lots of people, I was collecting an Empire army, but I had this, this unit of Dwarfs. And I think I kind of just liked them more than the rest of the army, <laughs> basically, just having these cool dwarfs. So, and so like, I, I, through this period into joining Games Workshop, I sort of was actually starting to build up my my own dwarf army instead, um, and and replacing and you know getting sidelining the empire stuff. Um, so yeah, and that kind of started it really. And here we are, however many years later. <laughs> yes, and I yeah. still got a lot bits of that army. In fact, not all of it, but some of that. Some of my old. I've still got the old, so like Imperial style Thunderers and crossbowmen uh, and things like that. They're actually bringing back some of these spearmen. Um, yeah, the sort of Landstech style. Clothing yeah, the more order miniatures type. Yeah, ones. yeah, yeah absolutely. It's a real. It's like a. It's like a. In the video games industry, they call it a vertical slice of like dwarf development, really, for over about twenty years, really. Yeah, it's a real yeah. kind of like or, or the strata of dwarf imagery from sort of like the late eighties into like the mid, well, early two thousands. <laughs> Yeah, all the way through. I know that Rob, who heads up the, the team, manages the old ball team, is really big into old hammer. So mm. he's really enjoyed going back and finding what what things the mold still exists for. They had yeah. ways of recasting them because that's limited him, but he's definitely bringing some of that in. But anyway, but I mean, you kind of went into one of my first questions, really, is about what was your history or with dwarves aside from working on them at the, the studios as though was it something you had an interest in before joining the studio were you a general fan of dwarves in fantasy maybe from talking and things like that I, I would say yeah possibly I think well there's it's interesting thinking about Tolkien dwarves because they're actually quite different really. Warhammer mm -hmm. dwarves have ended up being quite different even though they're obviously inspired by it and things like that but yeah I, I would guess so there's a certainly exposure to the hobbit and the lord of the rings at uh, crucial ages certainly influenced me and i'm definitely more of a fan of gimli than i was legolas um <laughs> you know legolas is just a bit too like good at everything whereas gimli you know before before getting into kind of comic relief versions of him but actually you know <laughs> um uh, just like a good solid character and you know without all the gifts of just being like an elf um who you know it's just like essentially magic all the way through so yeah i think i have um always had a, a, a and, and also just sort of like that um that sort of like north northern imagery as well you know that they come from that that um, kind of viking vibe i kind of i, I like that i've always associated that, that imagery um with stuff you know the, the the combination of that with the dwarfs has always been quite strong for me um yeah so yeah i think it's it, it was certainly there I, like I, said, I didn't necessarily historically collect them a lot um before sort of like the early 90s um but then from then on it so uh, i was aware of them and like i say I, I remember those miniatures as well i didn't necessarily have a lot of them myself at the time um but picked a lot of them up so sort of like i say early 90s and into like joining games workshop um so uh but then yeah since then as well you know i just <laughs> i mean we're here to talk about one dwarf but i have about you know, i i i have dwarf miniatures from all over basically of just like i love seeing really cared for dwarf models like 3d prints or mm. or plastics or whatever and they're all on the pile of shame at the moment but it's like um so yeah it's it's definitely there. <laughs> it's not just, you know, they, they, they are, I do keep coming back to them. Similar for me. They were the, the first plastic miniatures that I made from that regiment set where you had the, oh, the 10 right, yeah, yeah. They were the very first things. I think the, the white dwarf in Hero Quest was the first dwarf I ever painted as well, oh, which okay. led on to it. So similar story. But, but so before you got to write dwarf rules and the, the sixth edition dwarf book which will come on to no doubt in a little in a short while did you have any projects for games workshop whether that was sort of white dwarf projects or writing projects that enabled you to sort of delve into dwarves before that or did you have to wait till you're working on warhammer more no so, so one of the first things we did one of our our tasks our duties when i joined as a system games developers we were well relaunching but launching a, a like a magazine called the citadel journal Mm -hmm. um and that was um it was sort of like an in-house fanzine almost um, and we were creating the idea is that we, we'd end up taking like community what would now be called community kind of creations and stuff like that um 
but but obviously the first couple of issues the first two or three issues we needed to get stuff up and running and it needed content so uh i was like the i i didn't do anything in the i, I came just as the first issue was actually going to repro graphics and stuff but from issue two onwards i did a series of man of war expansions and again so again going back to what i was saying earlier so man of war I actually had an empire fleet because i liked just like lots of big guns and and sail ships and my friends had Bretonians. i didn't the doors were kind of cool but i didn't want a steamship game i wanted a sailing game because i love age of sail as well so i didn't you know it didn't quite gel for me but actually but i still liked the aesthetic of it but yeah so i think it may have been the first one i did was expansion the basically runes and engineers um for dwarfs in man of war um uh, and then i went on to do some stuff for elves and a couple of the other fleets but uh, uh, but yeah so there was obviously there already a, the, the first out of the bat was the and again the runes are something i really like in that kind of um you know build your own type um experience you get with like dwarf sister the dwarf uh the army book the, the fourth edition dwarf army book mm -hmm. how, you know introduced the rune system and things like that and so I actually i wanted to put that into man of war because it was so fun um so yeah that was my first thing and i guess so i had a little bits of it through uh working on warhammer quest as well yeah. so again that was quite a big project uh you know headed up by andy jones but i don't know because we did uh, in fact, no, I played the Barbarian, not the Dwarf, during the playtesting and things. Um, but there were various... Um, there, we didn't necessarily get around to doing all the warrior packs and things because we did like develop a Troll Slayer at one point. Um, there was the Dwarf Miner. And uh, there might have even been another one, but I can't remember. So I, I can't remember. I don't think... I think Andy did the Slayer, but I think, I yeah, I had some hand in some of the Dwarf stuff for that. Um, uh, and then, you know... Uh, Warhammer Quest, we did some extra articles and things for White Dwarf, but, but um, nothing specifically dwarfs. And unfortunately, we didn't get around to doing a dwarf pack for them. You know, we did, we had uh, we had Lair of the Orc Lord and we had um, uh, Catacombs of Terror, but it would have been nice actually to do an adventure delving into an old uh, an old dwarf hold. One of my favourite old stories is Dark Beneath the World. Mm -hmm. um, one of the old, uh, is it Felix? I remember, was it? Yes. I can't yeah, remember. Yeah. yeah. Where they're going into, it's like, it's really warhammer and it's really old dwarf, like, you know, ruins and overrun with goblins. And, and I've always liked Caracate Peaks and stuff and the idea of like the goblins and the Skaven having taken over and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, it would have been lovely to do a, it would have been lovely to do an adventure pack of like going back into the old holds or something like that would have been oh, great. Oh, yes, absolutely. Uh, maybe absolutely. I'll do that for my own self. Um, <laughs> uh, and then similarly on on the on the Warhammer side, you know, again there wasn't there was like Circle of Blood for Undead and there was Idol of Gork and things, these campaign packs, but didn't quite get around to the dwarves before the new Warhammer came out. So <laughs> that's fair enough, fair enough. So let's fast forward a little bit then to the, the sixth edition dwarf army book. And I know mm. that you're that Alessio is credited as, as well. I know you wrote yeah. some of it, but that you wrote the, the the bulk of it, at least it, it feels like that. Let's let's talk to me about that. What uh, what were the challenges in, involved in that? And what did what, what did you are you happy with what you came out with in the end? I think so, yeah. Yeah, I can see it there. And I, I love that cover. I've got the print of that and I still haven't found somewhere to put it up. Um because it's so big, but the the um Alex Boyd, beautiful mm. cover, um, signed by him. Um and uh, yeah, so it was tricky because you know this was one of the first books out. I took over, so I took over. So two of us, I'd actually done Inquisitor, and I was busy running Inquisitor through White Dwarf and and kind of like doing the tail end of that and things. And then basically Thomas, you know, job done with Sixth Edition, decided to move into the video games industry, and uh, and then we had a big reshuffle. And I was made Warhammer, and we had we 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 had teams before then, but we properly divided into Warhammer and 40k and Lord of the Rings teams. Well, Lord of the Rings came a little bit later, but so I was Warhammer Lawmaster, and basically I was working with Jake Thornton and Alessio. Um, but there was sort of like half a plan really. The Empire book was was a well underway. The Orcs and Goblins was kind of been done. The Dwarfs the the range plan had kind of been done, but there wasn't really much of a plan for the book itself. And then we kind of, the elves and the dark elves and, and high elves and dark elves sort of plan was a little bit like, like back of a fag packet kind of like stuff. So there was a lot to do, pick up and, and run with. But the dwarfs, I definitely, um, you know, it was just a case of like, well, I know, I know I like dwarfs and this is what I like about dwarfs. So we just need to make sure that's in the new system. And it wasn't mm -hmm. about reinventing anything. It wasn't particularly masses of new miniatures being made in terms of like troop types and stuff like that um so it was just a case of it was, it was transitioning it into sixth edition was the main thing but also 
and and but also doubling down on the background of it and and making sure that character of the dwarfs came through. But the main thing I did, um, uh, which was uh, not controversial stuff, I suppose, but I, I wanted to make sure that dwarfs players had some options of other than just like casting up at the back. Is like actually having an offensive dwarf army was was potentially viable. That not actually the, like you know. Uh, you know, not going to be like outcharging Bretonians and stuff, but the idea that you know, dwarfs send out expeditions is not all defensive fights, that they have a way of attacking. And the simple thing with that is it was introducing the idea that they could always march, basically. So they had this close maneuver in almost mm -hmm. like a Roman style way. So they didn't really make, you know, that again, they're not going to outcharge anyone's stuff, but they could support each other quite nicely and actually get across the table. Uh, and with and with units like miners and stuff as well that, um, uh, could like bring the fight to the enemy a little bit more um, as an option, not like the be all and end all of it. I do. It's funny because I remember, and, and we were very much streamlining the armies and what they could have at this point. Because I remember, so the first, well, first Warhammer staff tournament, uh, which was great fun, and, and it was held at the studio, and we had people from all over the company playing. Um, and I ran into uh, my first round. I had my dwarf army, and I ran into my first the, a dwarf army uh, as well. But his army, so I had like what I would consider a proper traditional dwarf army. You know, you know, so I had lots of infantry and a few artillery. And he had like three organ guns more than me and a griffin and a hippogriff. And I was like, that's just not dwarf. It's like, I know you can have them and you can have the, you know, back to like almost third edition of like the, the um, you know, um, enchanted beasts almost and stuff. It's like, no. So, you know, um, that was one of the big changes. We took a lot of stuff, options out of armies at this point. Yeah. And so we were focusing on like, what is dwarfy. Um, so, you know, removing some of those crutches really of like, oh, I've got dwarfs, but I've, you know, I'll just throw in a hippogriff to give myself something fast yeah. to attack with, or allied empire knights, or which was always another popular one. I think he had a unit of rights guard as well, knights, and you just like, this, you know, it's kind yeah. of cool. It was all right, and it's kind of you could get some interesting things, but it's like if you're gonna fight with dwarfs, you fight with dwarfs. So, so embodying a dwarf army without those elements with some kind of more attacking. Uh, tactics or, or or options was what was necessary really yeah yeah fun in a bit fun in a really big narrative multiplayer game but yeah as the general theme of an army that you're trying to portray through a set of rules then i i think it definitely makes sense i um it's interesting i was reading this dwarf dwarf again recently and you wrote mm. an article around the launch of the game and you were talking about the challenges of movement and the relentless rule, which you obviously discussed about marching while in, while within eight inches and those kind of things, and it's it seems like it's an age old problem for, for for dwarves, isn't it? Make them interesting, make them give them the ability to to outflank or that kind of stuff, but without taking away the essence of of what dwarves is, or making them boring to play or play against. Yes, yeah. I mean, there, there was there was lots of ongoing conversations about stuff at this point, and that, and of course, the tournament scene was really growing. And there were, you know, lots of our playtesters were tournament players and things, and that was always useful. Um, but it was never like the be all and end all of what makes a good army, because a good for any given value of good is like, well, it doesn't mean they can beat everybody or the, you know. And then there was a lot of discussion at the point. And I remember I was on the active on the war. It was literally just called the Warhammer Forum at the time, um, and people complaining that dwarfs weren't competitive in 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 tournaments. And the issue was that a lot of tournaments ran on VPs then, and basically. Dwarves could win a lot of battles, but they couldn't get like crushing victories. They wouldn't yeah. like sweep you off the table like chaos or Bretonians. And I basically just said, well, if you're if you if you're um if you're playing Warhammer to win tournaments, don't take dwarves. Oh, but I want to take dwarves. Then in that case, you have to you know you have to realize that while tournaments are set out like this, you're not going to get that because they're just not going to they're not designed to run people down. But they're really solid, and actually they they had that you know you could have over. a good players would have a very good win rate but they just wouldn't have that i've just tabled you kind of yes. victory conditions they needed to get best general and stuff like that and it's like well but to do that with dwarves either means just upping up the firepower of them so much that they just basically kill you before you get to them or do or changing the very nature of what it is to be dwarves in terms of their attacking and stuff um but actually yeah it's like no this is one of those where you have to decide are you a tournament player or you're a dwarf player and some people didn't like that but it's like you have to get your priorities. Like, if you want an army that's going to win at tournaments, take one of these armies. And if you want to collect dwarfs, then you can't. You know, you can't have. You know, until people change the way the the, the tournament systems work, you can't have both. And no. And for me, I'm a dwarf player. It's more important. And for the majority, again, for the majority of people, that's fine. You know, it's like we, we're attracted by the imagery with the armies we want to play and paint and the style. You know, it's like the 
the wind rate isn't necessarily that's a, that's a very rarefied criteria but if you're going to complain about it in, a, in that particular setting and that's therefore what you're making the priority you go well you have to make your decisions based on that priority yeah. you can't expect designers to make everything everything can't be in that spot it just doesn't yeah. work that way um, but you know a lot of players just love playing with dwarfs at that time i think um, and it was it was very invigorating for them they did like i say they did there, there was a nice um, swell of enthusiasm for them and for some different styles of, of dwarf armors. It wasn't just gun lines, um, yeah. which was good. Um, yeah. I always wanted to just make sure my slayers could get in. That was the important thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. And it was never a tournament game anyway. It was just a, a game that people play well, in tournaments. That, yeah. that maybe AOS and 40K now are moving towards a different style. But that's another conversation <laughs> so, so moving on through sixth edition then so you're managing uh, the fantasy and yeah and i guess we move towards the seventh edition book and i'm not sure whether you had any involvement in yeah that, that sort of gearing towards that because it was it was almost a kind of sixth stroke seventh edition release time wasn't it for that one but i don't know if you had any involvement in that or what your direction was sort of thing. yeah so so you yeah, know at, at this stage our major so the push was Obviously, this was the, for for both 40k and one. Obviously, War, Warhammer was getting regiment sets out, so it's getting stuff into plastic. This was this was now us rolling into the proper games workshops, going to make plastic ranges as best it can, which meant a bunch of stuff like obviously getting troop types of stuff out, but for the dwarfs in particular, it's like getting getting plastic war engines and that kind of thing. So actually, they were quite high on the priority, and as one of the core armies, one of the most popular armies, they were on the schedule again quite soon for for getting the miniature. Say soon, you know, like within three or four years. You know, and, and they had, but we also had the skull. You know, actually, we had the uh, seventh edition was the skull pass set, I believe. Mm -hmm. So there were plastics. There was the, you know, there was um, push fit plastics and stuff in the starter sets. So and dwarfs again were were quite, you know, that became a a, a very strong image of Warhammer, um, of of dwarfs versus goblins, basically, which was cool. I mean, I, I didn't I didn't make that decision, but I wasn't unhappy with it i was obviously part of the part of that process of, of what the set could be um and, and that you know that idea of like being able to re not literally refight um black fire pass but you know the heroic kind of like the dwarfs first it was a, a classic dwarf imagery you know compared to like fifth edition which had been like bretonians versus lizard men which was just like because they hadn't been done and it was a way of introducing them but which was like that was cool but you like yeah back to back to real core Warhammer imagery. So, yeah, so the dwarves were quite high on the priority of getting more plastics because of the style of the army, actually getting those war engines into plastic and things. Um, I don't think we necessarily did much of it at that stage, but it was like a stepping stone towards that. Um, but the book was written by Pete Haynes, but, mm -hmm. and who, again, was another actual dwarves fan. He was he played dwarves. He had a great dwarves army. He really, uh, he really embraced... The, what I want, what I've done with the sixth edition, and just took it a little stage further. Um, and uh, to, you know, I was I was still Warhammer Lawmaster at that point, so I I did the brief for the Dwarfs book, but it was it was very much just a conversation with Pete because he he knew again he didn't want to. Uh, Pete was again was a very very good player, very very number crunchy. Would like and again not necessarily competitive in a in a bad way, but he was he you know he knew how to make a dwarf army that would win games and things like that yeah. from that point of view so i trusted him on that it was just making and but but equally on the dwarfs as well he was just very good at making sure that doing that didn't throw out what was cool about dwarfs that he didn't yeah. compromise like everything we've just been talking about um it was just about you know making sure those things happened and we came up you know between us i mean he came up with some cool stuff for the background and and things like reckoners and that kind of idea and we get you know the idea of the um, rune stones and more so, you know we again we were just trying to explore the imagery and we see it there in in uh, sixth and seventh of you know of shield bearers because because we love asterix and just having a dwarf a big wing helmet on a shield you're just like why wouldn't you why we yeah. why wouldn't you have vital statistics in leading your dwarf army because again but and that was just building on the throne of power idea it was already there the palanquin or whatever it wasn't like but it was just taking that imagery and 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 doubling down on it really and making something more warhammery and the idea of oath stones and the oath stones thing was just basically because obviously the rule of warhammer is more important you are the bigger the hat you have um, you know, we just, it's just the way, but it's hard to make, because they're not mounted and things, it's hard to make dwarf character models more visible, more spectacular. So actually literally just raising them up yes. um, and making yeah. them more prominent. So you go, well, there's your general, there's, you know, uh, he's decided. And again, it just all played into 
the strengths were like because again you could march forward but then plant your stone and stay there and hold that ground and stuff so it was it was kind of cool so it was yeah it was definitely like a really a 6.5 um in t- but and, and and again you know uh pete did some very good stuff with the rune system and just making some more efficiencies or, or tweaking down a couple one or two things that helped you know uh, with shooting and, and stuff like that so you know um overall yeah it was just like kind of taking the ideas that i'd had and then getting somebody who's a little bit crunchier than i am to go through that and change some of the numbers and and, and just really make it tick um uh, which pete was really good at um and and again on the the on the background side um not really needing to do too much, just like polish, polish the presentation really of what was already there, which is what I'd done with the previous book. Really, there wasn't. We'd, um, that was one with a lot of the sixth edition book, a lot of the text, and particularly like that we had these little box outs from like this grumbling old um, Longbeard. Um, I can't remember his name now, but there a lot of those were written by Space McQuirk, and he really got into the character of this guy. So again, one of the things we wanted to do was, although unlike 40k, which had gone very away from Word of God. Um, you know, like in Warhammer, we we still wanted to make sure we had some of that history and geography, and there was just a good overview. Mm-hmm. But then, but then have some space of the the, the armies, the, the races telling their own story, and it was a bit yeah. of a mix there. So actually, having the dwarf talking about being a dwarf and getting that voice in there, and again, you know, Pete was good at the, you know he he really got that and continued that in the next edition of the book. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, as someone who's played all of those additions one way or another they do feel like a nice slow progression that reflects the addition i suppose a few more special characters in seventh the removal maybe of the alternative army list like the expeditionary force and the yeah. slayers and things like which interesting enough are coming back by the looks of things in 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 the old world but uh yeah um was it was that a difficult decision to kind of remove those flavorful army things or was it just a case of you had to do it to match the the, the new edition really i think that was the thing yeah there was uh, and there was a there was more of a thing again across. We'd been doing lots of stuff in White Dwarf with old weirdies in Kinabalum and and uh, Warhammer Arcana. I can't know, can't remember now. Whatever our equivalent of index, no, in Kinabalum was the equivalent of index of size. Our equivalent of chapter approved Warhammer Chronicles. That was it. Right. Yeah. And we'd been doing, you know, um, and there'd been quite, doing quite a few variant army lists, but actually there was a sense at the time there was a bit too much army list proliferation. Uh, and particularly with stuff that was just, and, and again, not necessarily in the books, but within White Dwarf stuff was getting a little bit too out there and not focusing on the miniatures enough and too much like converting the entire army kind of stuff. Um, so that was kind of like the policy coming down to us of like, let's just focus on an army and an army list. Um, but also we obviously, um, we had um, Storm of Chaos and we had the mm. Slayer army. Um, which was, you know, so it, it was a case of like, if we're going to do variants, just rather than doing this little appendix thing, let's kind of do them properly, put, find a place for them, that kind of thing. Um, which, uh, well, yeah, it was kind of just a more overall decision, I think. And it, and it meant well, we could just, rather than trying to, because they had this kind of weird state of like being in the book and, and like, but were they, uh, you know, uh, were they as tested as the main list and that kind of stuff and things like that? So it was like, no, it's just there's an army list that keeps it simple. Here's, here's another official army list, either in White Dwarf or another book, but actually uh, focus really on on the strongest imagery and stuff that again is based off miniatures of 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 um, uh, and and um, you know, like I say, that's one of the again, interestingly, in the fullness of time, you know, we've seen. You know, with AOS like focusing on the Slayer imagery as obviously that's one of the most Warhammer dwarf images there is, which is like yes. the least traditional and actually, but that, you know, even going back to it kind of springs off like you know the cover of the one fancy role play with the dwarf punk dwarf there and stuff is kind of like proto Slayer obviously and things like that, um, and then obviously Age of Sigma is focused in on very specific bits of. Yeah, more Warhammery bits of dwarfs mm. and turn them into entire army. I've got one, in fact, you know. Um, but uh, but for me, it's the blend. I think you know. Yes. Um, yeah. Yeah. Makes it's sense. like yeah, these guys are the crazy berserker types within the scope of the entire army. But yeah, well, uh, I think that I think their character is stronger when they are different from the norm. Yeah. When they become the norm, um, they're still great, yeah. but they maybe lose some of that special. No, no absolutely. And we got to play around with that a bit with Storm of Chaos and the various armies in there with the Slayer army and 
uh, the you know because again it was just uh, it's miniature slayers like let, let's just do some a cool new slayer character and, and people like collecting slayers and it's an excuse to do a you know just like in terms of sales it's a nice slayer box um you know what would have been wonderful is if we've been able to get plastic slayers at that point that would have been mm. you know that would have been the really sensible that's what would happen these days with the results yes. they've got these days would, would have been like uh which i ended up doing the entire slayer on but you know you know that that we didn't quite have those resources at the time everything uh, was like extra metal really uh, but we might never have had the goblin hewer then if you had to choose plastics you see so well, you would have missed out yeah it's true yeah the <laughs> goblin hewer yeah exactly i love that again it's just like because it was trying to find you know because they've got plenty of you know dwarfs not short of war engines and stuff so it's like well how do you do something that's slightly different to an organ gun slightly different to a stone throw what what's the thing it's like well actually you know uh, just something that chucks loads of axes, just as an image, but also like more of a machine gunny type but, but things for taking yeah. out lots of weaker stuff, yeah. um, which was something that the Slayer army wasn't so good at because obviously Slayers are good at taking down tough stuff, but actually yeah. get bogged down, hewing down goblins. So it was that was part of that as well, of just like, you know, as part of an overall army design. But actually, yeah, dragging Malachi McKyson across from the, the, the Got Trek series and stuff again and making yeah. bedding that in was really fun. Yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah, it's crazy a, it's a we never got around to doing that dwarf dirigible, dwarf airship. Oh, yes. We wanted One it day. so much. And Tim Adcock, the sculptor, was well up for it as well. We wanted to, if we, again, you know, obviously in the fullness of time, we have an entire army of floating dwarfs now. Um, yes. Dw sorry, Dwardin. Um, so, you know, no, no idea goes unpunished eventually. Um, and, 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 you know, like I say, all good, you know, I, the, you know, I love it actually to see that those, some of those ideas are finally born fruit in one way or another that we weren't able to get around. Um, I suspect yeah. there'll be a, I suppose we haven't got an entire dragon mounted high off army yet, but, um, that was, I'm sure it'll that come was another there. wish list. We have, a, we have <laughs> armies of giants now, so. <laughs> we do, was, we do. Um, Beautiful models as well. Yeah. Can we again. move? We move slightly away from the rules side of things. And this yes. is skipping ahead a little bit of your first kind of bits of fiction, your main released fiction. But I feel this has got a kind of a foot in both camps. And we look at Grudge Law, which I yes. think was like 20, 2008. This is a Black Library publication. I think, uh, I it, think it might have been before. I think the original one might have been before. Was right. it 2008? I can't remember. Uh, my poor research. Uh, no, no, no. It, it, it may well be because like I say that stuff blurs in because that's like, obviously, I still work in Black Library through leaving the studio and stuff yeah. like that, that kind of, um, and I was working on Malekith at the time. So maybe Grudge Law was just before that, or, or you know, obviously, and it's working on the thing before it comes out a year later or whatever. But yeah, I mean, Grudge Law, it was, um, a labor of love mm, for, for both he and Nick Kime. Cause again, Nick Kime, so he was editor at White, uh, Black Library at the time for a long time. Um, and was a, a big fan of the dwarfs and obviously he's written some dwarf novels himself. Um, and it was like, yeah, how do we present like a, a non-definitive, definitive history of the dwarfs, really, um, in the in the in the mold of um, sort of like the Libra Chaotica and stuff that was very popular at the time, um, and and just going to town on it, really. Um, the uh, and, and actually, what one of the nicest things about the Grudge Law, because um, there's an expanded lexicon in there. Um, and a, an expanded section on the dwarf language, which we got Rick to write because he had done the original dwarf language stuff in the fourth edition book. So it was like, hey, Rick, you know, and actually he's like, well, there's a bunch of stuff that I'd kind of come up, him and Nigel had come up with that hadn't gotten into the fourth edition book. So we're like, cool. And then obviously there's a bunch of words we'd invented and stuff along the way that we added into the lexicon and then create some roots for them and stuff like that. So that's one of, and actually I know that. So, um, David Geimer, who's one of the Black Library authors now, and Rip writes a lot of the Gotrek stuff and dwarf-related stuff, always is always going back to that lexicon and creating mm -hmm. proper dwarfs, constructing dwarf language from it for, for use in the books and stuff. And it's like it's probably the only example in any of the Warhammer universes of an actual properly, you know, properly constructed language because Rick actually thought about it as much as there's always the comedy like curry and it's called Kazi lid and all that kind of stuff, <laughs> which is just like, it's just very typical one of like on the level it's just totally works and it's, it's a proper you know, uh, language. Um, and on the level level, it's just full of gags and, yes. and stuff as well, which is why I love it. So, you know, but yeah, you know, being able to to delve into the, the, the great hits and misses of the dwarfs over the time. And, you know, sort of like sat down with Nick, we worked out what were the things we wanted to talk about and how were we going to present them and what was the resources we had for like doing cool maps and, and whatever else. And then how were we going to do certain things? Um, 
so yeah it was it was just a lot of fun and um uh i still i think my favorite is still like all the all of the dwarf names for calador the second which is like yes. calador the pointlessly tall and calador <laughs> the coward and stuff like that which was just <laughs> sitting down and coming up with all these insults for for this uh this traitorous treacherous elf king um, it's, it's so. a beautiful book and it, it it goes for crazy money so if anyone wants to get hold of it and able to for for less than about 200 pounds on ebay then they're mm. then they're very very lucky but it's it's a, it's a beautiful book and you yeah. can see the love that's gone into it and it's of its time you wouldn't you i can't see that being books like that being made today they're too far away from it's not rules it's not fiction you don't yeah, seem to see I'm, that kind of production now yeah possibly i mean there's uh, yeah, it depends on style, I suppose, because there there was a there was a recent kind of update of essentially the Index of Starties. There was a guide to the founding chapters, but, but that's Space Marines, and they break all the rules. You can get away with publishing something about Space Marines because you just know it's going to sell X yeah, amount yeah. before. So, so yeah, I mean, um, uh, but interestingly, if people um, again, probably not as easy to get anymore. But the Dwarf Omnibus that combines Grudge bearer and nick's two no novels have most of grudge law actually as appendices in the back of that omnibus yes yeah so but not the complete thing and not the full format which is the lovely it's lovely you know i the, the thing is i mean I'd, I'd make a fortune now i think i must have given them away or sold them earlier because i used to i had back then we used to get three author copies so i had three copies of grudge law um i've only <laughs> got one left now which I've, i'm not getting rid of um oh, so um yeah uh uh, but yeah, the, the the large format is definitely um, uh, the way to to view it, as it were. Being yeah, lovely things, and along with all the other sort of uniform guides that came out around that sort of more around that period, uh, and lovely things to get hold of. And I stupidly yes. got rid of a few of those things over the years, and yeah. I wouldn't want them, and very much regret it now. Um, yeah, I've got. I, I keep meaning to, you know, I've I've got a box of of like you know the. Um, Uplifting Primer and the, the Witch Hunter's Handbook and all various other things. Yeah. Libra Necris and what, a few of those. That was like, uh, I made space on the shelf a, a while ago and I've still not quite got around to putting them on eBay, but yeah, at some point. They'll, uh, You'll do quite well, I think. Yeah. <laughs> um, so if we move into fiction then, it feels like a, yes. yeah, yeah. a, a good way to do it. Um, and I've got them in what I think is release order, but we can sort of just talk about them all, all, all together in some ways. You've had Ancestral Honor, which is a, a short. And then you oh, have right, Ro yes. Oh, yeah, I love that story. I love writing that. Great little story. Grimly, very familiar-ish name there. <laughs> yeah, <right>? yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and then we've got Grudge Bearer. Which, yes. um, which is a full-length novel, which is part of the Dwarfs um, omnibus you can get now with um, Nick Kimes' books. And then you've got the the Doom of Dragonback as well, which has now been added to the big omnibus, the, the um, Masters of Stone and Steel, I think is the latest right, publication yes. way. And I, I absolutely love that story. We talked a little about that a little bit before um, before we started recording, and I won't get into the detail of it because that may be another time. But um, so I talk, I went, when were you approached to, to first start writing the fiction, sort of talk us through the journey with that um well i mean i uh i was in that fortunate position that when games workshop was setting up black library i was like sitting three desks across from andy jones who was setting up black library and, and brought in mark gaskell brought back mark gaskell in to set it up as editor and stuff like that so um as he talked about divorce funnily enough yeah this kind of does loop round. um so so they were they were setting up this fiction imprint um and they started with Inferno magazine, which was a bi-monthly collection of like short comic strips and short stories. Uh, and obviously, I'd, I'd worked with Andy quite a bit on Warhammer Quest. And uh, I, th by this point, I'd I suppose I was getting I was I was known for my work on the background and being able to write, uh, you know, sort of like the background pieces and things like that and the storytelling side of stuff. So, so Andy had said, "Well, we're doing this. Do you want to have a try at writing a short story?" Um, and it's like okay, I'd never written any like pure prose of that length before or anything like that. Um, so I decided to do something, write something that was like you know I knew quite well in theory, uh, didn't have to come up too much plot. So I wrote Birth of a Legend, which is basically the story of how Sigmar got his hammer. <laughs> so right. it's like just a small small topic that we'd throw away. No, um, but of course, and half of that was actually from the dwarf's point of view from. Um, the dwarf king captured by the orcs and and uh and and, you know, and i wrote that in the first you know the first um 
first draft of that came back covered in red pen and all the rest of it, but but was solid enough that they decided you know it was worth a redraft. And I look back at it and there's like there's clunky bits and, and stuff like that, but it's pretty solid. Um, you know, story about Sigma rescuing King Kurgan and, and being presented with Heldon Hammer at the you know, sorry, with um, Gal Moraz at the end. Um, so, um, yeah, so my first story actually had dwarfs in it and it's kind of quite dwarfy. Um, and, and so from there, I was writing short stories, uh, quite a lot of to be fair. I think at that stage, uh, I was writing more Warhammer short stories than 40k ones, although my first novel was actually Last Chances. Um, mm-hmm. so then when it came round to do want to write a Warhammer novel, it was like, yeah, cool. Um, uh, and, I, and it was just like, yeah, I'll write about dwarfs. <laughs> it's like, I'll write a dwarf story. And I def- and I had an idea right from the start. And the thing I wanted to get across was the longevity of dwarfs and their thinking and grudges. You know, what is what? And how that's different from this human. I've always, like, with the dwarfs and when I did the Eldar novels and stuff as well, it's all about trying to get into, into their heads, but also just literally their viewpoint of the way the world works around them and seeing humans in some ways through their eyes and stuff. So... Uh, the you know, um, the breaking it down into the various grudges against people allowed me to have like you know, well, there's a fight against Skaven, there's a fight against orcs, and there's a fight against humans or whatever. And the idea that you know, the time of the character progresses differently to what the humans perceive as, and so mm-hmm. you know, knowledge in age, but you know, it covers for, for humans, it covers several centuries, but it's just a lifetime for the yeah. dwarfs and his, and his and his rise uh, and the responsibilities and basically you know the story is he you know, he, he takes over the city inherits the grudges uh, and, and what's he going to do with it you know it's like is he going to be known for settling grudges how many more is he going to build up and part of it is a build up to storm of chaos at that point that's why I remember. Yes, yeah. it's been a long while since i wrote it um <laughs> and read it but uh, i remember most of it i think um so yeah, it was kind of like it was a night. Nice, it was an excuse to be a bit of a tra- dwarf travelogue as well, but 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 being bedded in dwarf society, not a story about dwarfs, but a story you know really with dwarfs. Yes, um, and that and that's why I wanted to get across. So you know, they come back and actually the grudge isn't like you know the grudge isn't against this human; it's against their grandson or whatever because that human's been long dead. But it's like it's, <laughs> well, you know, the family inherits the grudge even though if they don't know about it and all that kind of stuff. Um, and, and and yeah, and we did the same with grudge law. You know, again, it was I think of what was it really? We go on about grudges a lot, but it's one of those things that like really binds. You know, it's like it's law. It's it's you know with law law and all the rest of it. And it's one of those things that's is very. We wanted to make sure, like you know, Warhammer dwarfs. It's not like it's not just like a vendetta. It's not just like you an IOU. It's like this is so embedded the grudge, and their record keeping, and that's that. that the, the weight of it, and like I say, I always loved the idea that that um, Pete came up with of the of the reckoners, um, and then they like basically they could buy grudges and they would then um, or, or they were kind of traded in grudges and stuff. But the idea that that the dwarfs believed that they might go to the afterlife of grudges with them hanging around their necks on stone, you know, if they weren't resolved, and and, and, and added that little layer to it. But you know how it drives their society. That's kind of the idea. Is it's in you know as much as we think about them as being like avaricious and, and gold hoarding and various other things, actually that tradition and that gr- and the grudges is actually one of the big wheels of their culture. Mm, and it's quite uniquely definitely. Warhammer-y. In it. Yeah, I think so. For, for, I think I think of Warhammer dwarves as grudges and honour. So, yeah. so the path to slay them rather than the, the Tolkien-esque, yeah. which is more about gold and how they may be, you know, driven mad by it, as we've seen in certain stories. Yes. For Warhammer, yeah, yeah it's, it's all about grudges and, and vengeance and honour. Um, and I think that's a really nice departure from from other forms of yeah. stereotypical now, I suppose. Yeah. Forms. And I think that, that, that people meant, a few people mentioned it, but I, so my highlight from Grudge Bearer, I think, actually is, uh, is demonstrating the, uh, the killing power of a dwarf pillow um, which is in one I won't spoil it, but there's a particular incident where a pillar is wielded as a weapon, um, yes, which is quite entertaining. Um, but and that kind of, and the other thing again um, is the because you don't get it very much really, but is um, there's a few songs in there 
because mm-hmm. I'm a sucker for I'm one of those people that's a sucker for songs in fantasy novels. But of course, they're all kind of folk songs. They're all based on or riffs on folk songs, or right. you know, um, or folk songs that have kind of become. There's one of kind of folk song that's kind of become a rugby song <laughs> and that kind of stuff. Um, and so because it's that kind of raucous sort of like you know, it's not refined music, right. uh, elven kind of like you know, harps and stuff. It's it's you know, banging your tankard yeah. on the table, Makes singing sense. stuff. Um, and there's because he gets married, I think, doesn't he? There's a uh, and, and that kind of stuff. So again, it's like ways of looking at dwarf culture away from the battlefield and and through his journey um, and, and all of these normal things. So yeah, there's quite a, a drunken um, song at his wedding, I think. Well, no, <laughs> not at his wedding. At his equivalent of his stag party, I think. Okay. And, which you'd yeah. expect, and I, and I really like yeah. that. By the way, your style of writing with them, and I think that continues in with the Doom of Dra- Dragonback as well. You feel like. You could be new to dwarves and read them and learn so much about dwarves in Warhammer and their society, right down to the everyday stuff. And you see that in the Doom of Dragon back as well. So but what approach did you did you take to, to writing that one? So that was a few years after as well, wasn't it? Yes. I mean that, that yes, that was um, you know, so Warhammer Legends, so the idea is picking something significant. And there was quite a lot of the ones we, we talked about. And Things are changing slightly. So, you know, obviously the, the big ones, like uh, Graham's Empire ones, I did the Sundering. Um, there was uh, Clint Werner was doing sort of like the big kind of like the big empire um, beats with the Skaven and and, yeah. uh, and and that kind of stuff. Um, but by this point, I think the sales were starting to drop off slightly. So they decided to do some one shots, really. So rather than, uh, and which is a shame because, of course, we've got the we'd just reached the point where we're going to do the War of Vengeance slash War of the Beard, which I think would have been, like, amazing. And there was a couple of them done, (laughs) but actually just done it, just gone in, like, full-on trilogy from the Elf point of view, trilogy from the Dwarf point of view, properly planned out and and done, I think would have been amazing, but that wasn't to be. Yeah, it really Um, was. um, So it was a slightly... uh, I wouldn't say the you know the novels were great and stuff, but it was like that. Unfortunately, the you know war the steam was running out of the Warhammer Legends series slightly at that point, mm-hmm. um, for whatever reason. So so Doom of Dragon Back to the Dwarf, you know, it's like uh, was an opportunity just to do this one off. So I'm trying to think of something that would fit, and and, uh, and having done Grudge Law and been quite you know familiar with a lot of the big dwarf events like Eight Peaks and stuff like that, there was a few contenders, but that was. Um, uh, I think it was just because actually it was it was an opportunity to almost look elsewhere because because it's not one of the ancient most ancient holds in the world's edge mountains and stuff like that. These relative into what again it's about dwarf perception of these newcomers have only been there like a cent you know a millennium or whatever. Um, so, uh, but but also this diaspora of dwarfs and actually the and, and how that had affected them and the fact they were slightly different and slightly more adventurous than the dwarfs that stayed at home and all that kind of stuff. So there was a nice, uh, but also just a very archetypical story of a dwarf hold falling to orcs and goblins, basically. And how would we tell that and uh, and that kind of exodus from a hold? Um, and it was a nice self-contained one, really, which didn't impact too much, and you know. So, yeah, and and I was very. I, I have an obsession with dwarf matriarchs. I think they're a character I like coming back to, and I've done something about without breaking any NDAs, but I've done something similar with that very recently, which hopefully will be coming out soon. Um, so, um, uh, so, so this image of like this dwarf matriarch, and uh, but actually how her backstory almost, and uh, you know, um, and and. A strong, you know, I remember it was a conversation with Rick because uh, there was a thing, and it, it was in one fancy role playing had been created for Stone and Steel or something of like, you know, there were ten male dwarfs for every female dwarf or whatever, and it was just like I, I wasn't that keen on it, but the idea that so Rick was basically explaining how dwarfs generally are just, you know, part of their image is like, you know, obviously they're, they're drawing on like these Yorkshire miners and that kind of stuff, but they're also they get to a certain age and they're just like they become old men tinkering in their shed and that's what they're interested in and actually women are this thing that happen and actually and so i kind of came up with this idea that it has to be that way because actually if they if the if the men folk outnumber the women folk for that it would just be carnage in terms of like just like evolution and reproduction so they don't want to get into that so actually they literally lose loads of their sex drive after a certain point and they just they're in you know that's why they get into gold and tinkering with machines or 
stills or whatever else because they just they become these old men tinkering around in their potting shed yeah um <laughs> which is where the the grandfather character comes yeah. into it he's literally has his potting shed almost and and that's kind of how the story starts really they have running to running with a troll um so um so yeah that that was so placing a female character in that situation and one who who doesn't want to conform to the normal like uh because again as we said they're, they're so bound up in tradition and this idea of hierarchy and status and things like that without having like a natural caste system and stuff but just the those trappings of like or marrying your way to the top and things like that and and you know her not wanting to have any of that really and one of her suitors being a prince and another one being basically being not a prince and just like the one she likes and it's a classic story really yeah. but then actually there's a third way but then all of this so it's got that lovely dwarf domestic drama whilst getting attacked by green skins it's kind of like yes. the, the the you know the the whole the, and, and again the the, the, how did it happen? It's, it's one of those questions I like. You know, there'll be a, there'll be a line in the timeline somewhere of like, you know, such and such fell, or yeah. uh, I, this is how I started doing the Raven Guard in Horus Heresy. Of like, just how did they get rescued? You know, those kind of things of like, it's, it's a very glib line of like, oh, and then such and such happened. You know, like, well, how how did that happen? What's that like to experience? That's for me. That's what Black Library is for. That's what Warhammer Fiction is for. Is to take those lines, take that battlefield ex- game experience and delve into it as a reality. So yeah, Doom of Dragon Battle was very much like, again, another chance. Um, one, my storytelling and my novel writing skills had come on, so I was able to deal with it in a slightly different way, but but just like, you know, yeah, another another good slice of life of dwarfness, but against this epic backdrop of, of what it's like to be under, you know, the, the, it's the outlying outpost of the dwarf empire starting to crumble really i think it does it excellently and i would encourage people to go and read it if they haven't already it's one i'm definitely gone there into one of my favorite uh warhammer novels mm. ever really fantastic without making you feel uncomfortable but i just i love it no i i, I, I mean I, you, you sort of say by the way right but they are the i have that and that i have an affinity with them that i, I think comes through in my right i enjoy mm. writing about them more than anything else and so i think it makes me easy to write i understand their stories really well so they're a joy um and the, the fact that i've only actually done two novels is a crime um yes. you know i think i would have loved to have done more like i say um but that wasn't to be but it's kind of um you know we're returning to the old world now there are novels being set back in sort of like the old world and things like that there is nothing on the doors at the moment but you know there's a the the doors open certainly the doors open slightly further than it was you know two or three years ago for going back to writing kind of classic warmer dwarfs so i know a lot of people would like that to happen especially after graham's (laughs) novel a lot of people are are hoping that with each new army release that there's another book that that goes that goes with it so i mean that it was bringing us towards the end, but it just kind of, you, we've edged on one of my final questions really is what, what plans did you have that you didn't get to do for dwarves? And that can be from game design or, or novels. And I think we've maybe hinted yeah. a little bit there already, but. Yeah. I mean, but on the novel side, um, cause I was thinking, cause there's, uh, I remember at the time, one of the things I was thinking of potentially doing was there's a, there's a crazy engineer character in the gyrocopter in grudge bearer. Mm-hmm. sort of crops up but he would have been a fun character to kind of follow around maybe not in novels but do some short stories of his adventures um or there was dran the reckoner i think is in there so again the story of a reckoner the novel yep. of him going around and doing his reckoning because they tend to leave a lot of dwarf society behind um or moving from hold to hold so that was kind of um for like a contemporary dwarf story that was that was or, or you know again in the, in the similar current uh like you know, within the realm of the reign of Carl Franz kind of type of story would have been quite cool. Any of the big hits, like say Fall of Caracate Peaks or um, like I say, any of the War of the Beard stuff, which was kind of nice to write in in overview for Grudge Law, but doing a whole series in the same way that I'd got to deal with the Sundering would have been amazing. Um, uh, would have been great. So yeah, it's, it's um, and I think you know, on the game side of stuff, again, there would have been just a bunch of stuff we could have done, which have which has been done in the fullness of time in terms of that plastics resource, of terms of yeah. what you know. If I was, if I had a magic wand and basically, you know, we could do that kind of stuff twenty years ago, then 
you know, what were the things we would have done? But that's the same for everything, really. You know, it's just, uh, you know, like say, doing cool dwarf airships and all that kind of stuff. But it's all all those ideas are, are sort of finding fruit in different ways. Um, uh, so yeah, I, it's um, it's something I've not thought about for a while because, like I say, I sort of draw a line under them because they were done. The old world was gone and stuff. So yeah. now it's starting to think again. But um, I've still got my dwarf army. Um, so they're there. To be fair, I've not played Warhammer with them for a while, but they have made guest appearances in other fantasy-based uh, mass battle <laughs> games recently. Um, so, um, but with the old world, actually, again, I've not got back into it, but I'm looking at it. So I don't need. It's probably so many games, uh, and uh, but I've got a ready-made army. So it's like uh, yeah, so you guys are going to say you can dust them, you can dust them off one day and give, yeah. them, give them give them a go. I know some folks who are getting into it. So, and it sounds cool what they've done with the system and that. So, um, you know, uh, it feels very again, Warhammer. Yes, which is which yeah. is a good thing when they've it's been so many so many years. Yeah. But there's always again there's also just like I say these days there's just old hammer. I could just play some sixth edition, seventh yeah, edition with them. I've got the army book still. <laughs> you know, it's like <laughs> still got them on the shelf. So you can just drag them out and play a game. That's, that's the cool thing. Is it you know. It doesn't need updating. Nothing needs downloading. Nothing goes out. It's like the rule books still work. The miniatures are still there. You can just still play. Is only. I mean, that's what I I warmed up for the old. Very dwarfy. Was, was starting with sixth edition, yeah. <laughs> and starting with that that army book. So back to square bases was warming up with with sixth edition and getting my nine year old to play it, which is probably a big stretch for his first war game. But we, yeah. we kind of managed it. We got that's it. cool. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. But um, yeah. Uh, I'm very conscious of the t the time now, and you've given a lot of time. To is there anything? What are you working on at the moment that you'd like to sort of sh share with with the viewers, and, and and anything you'd like to plug before we let you? Yeah, go? so I suppose the main plug is um, <laughs> sorry, uh, I've been um, working on a science fiction skirmish game called Zeo Genesis, mm -hmm. uh, which is about big armored suits, manga, anime sort of inspired, uh, with a rule system written by Andy Chambers. That I'm sure a lot of your listeners will be aware of, um, and I've been doing. I've, been helping Andy a bit with the rules but mostly doing the world building for that uh, and the mm -hmm. narrative and story um so that's uh that should be rolling out through between now and the end of the year really and there will be more um you can sign up for play testing and discord on zeogenesis.com um and then um yeah you'll be getting notifications for like uh you can download the playtest rules, play them now, uh, and, and see pictures of cool toy soldiers and stuff like that. That's the main thing. I, on the subject of dwarfs, I'm currently so I have a Patreon, which is Gavthorpe Creates. Um, well, yes, Gavthorpe writes. I don't know, Gavthorpe. It should be. So, send, send me a Gavthorpe. link, and I'll put, put yeah, it in the video we'll, description. We'll, we'll that. Um, but I, I, I'm currently developing a dwarf based skirmish game called Carvenheim, which is sort of like inspired by a miniatures range from a friend of mine at Dragon's Forge. Um, so, um, which is basically uh, Wars of the Roses meets Dwarf City, oh, but it's not an yeah. underground city. So they basically the the background for the dwarfs are these Stonebreaker dwarfs. Is they've been they basically chased out by out of their hold by uh dragons and goblins and they built this big city above ground but it's only temporary because one day they'll come back and reclaim but essentially unfortunately the, the entirety of the royal family for several successions was wiped out fighting so that the, all of the claimants are scrabbling and they send parties back into the hole to try and find evidence of their claim and they've been doing this for about five thousand years now um <laughs> you know in a dwarf so but but actually the game carvin helheim itself is more of a it's more of a mafioso style trying to uh, is a, about their reputation and staking control over the city of Carvenheim itself. There'll be another game, hopefully down the road, about going back and finding dwarfs and dragons and stuff. But it's so you run you run a claimant's faction basically, and you're the idea I'm working with at the moment is you're essentially the the conciliary, you're the shot caller of it. So the the you're not the claimant themselves; they just give you the round and you know like putting hits out on people or doing all that kind of gang stuff. But also just because of the way that the miniatures range works that uh, Dragon's Forge have got. So they've got like a hot dog stand and they've got a flower girl and stuff. So some of the missions might be just like, you know, go and get me a dozen hot dogs for the boys kind of stuff. Um, so adding, again, trying to put, it's not Warhammer Dwarves, but trying to get that character, the dwarfy yeah. character that I love without duplicating Warhammer because I don't want to do anything. But so yeah. building my own dwarf IP really around that. So that's, yeah, that's been good fun actually. Sounds, amazing. Paint, paint Sounds like the Mordheim dwarf. and Blood Bowl and Warhammer all rolled into yeah, one. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. yeah. 
there's yeah definitely elements of that yeah so and let's say yeah five six models probably um, up to about eight models per side so quite a nice small scale skirmish game um, really focused on the character and like about dwarfs just nothing but dwarfs well, i'll so. definitely be looking out for that that sounds really really interesting definitely cool. definitely <laughs> Thank you so much for spending the time to talk to me today and, and talk about dwarves. Um, and it was a bit of a probably an unusual request because it's not sort of a, the wider history. Is very, no, it's, very it's easy. I can talk, <laughs> like I said, we will do. We'll find other occasions to talk about stuff. I'm sure. We'll, yeah, absolutely. Come back to. So to come topics. back to dwarves, hopefully, even more, because yeah. I feel like we've glossed over all of these that could have been conversations in themselves, just about single books and things. But uh, we really do appreciate it. Happy to come um, back and do that. Definitely, well, we'll definitely erase it. Thank you very much for it. Well, I hope you enjoyed the conversation with Gab. I had a great time chatting to him. I found it really, really interesting. I just wanted to delve really, really deep into all of those subjects around the rules writing for dwarves, around the novels he's written. And hopefully in the future, I can get him back on the channel to discuss those things a little bit more. If you've enjoyed the video, please do give it a like. It really helps the video be seen by others. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. There's loads of Warhammer, fantasy, Warhammer, the old world related content, loads of painting tutorials, general discussion of that kind of thing. If you'd like to support the channel further, I have a patron. It's a really great way of helping me keep the lights on, so to speak. The channel also has a Discord as well. I'll pop links to all of those in the video description, along with a link to Gav's patron. But thank you very much for watching. Take care. And I'll catch you soon.